Okay, so it looks like there are 23 of you right off the bat. So um, I would like to alert everyone to the chat function on here um, because you can ask questions and I'll be able to see that throughout this whole webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and type in there now so you guys can kind of see that, etc. Um, so because it looks like there are already some of you in here. So I care. Thanks for uh, coming. Appreciate that. Um, looks like we need to mute someone here. I'm not sure how to mute, so I, uh, you might need to, the other host here might need to mute. Um, so I think I can hear you, just FYI. So if we can get that taken care of, then I will go ahead and uh, start. Okay, cool. Looks like we're good. Um, all right, cool. So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, so today we are going to talk about the benefits of fermentation. Thanks to Cherry Brook for um, having me and wanting me to come in and talk about fermentation and how fermentation makes uh, pet food healthier. So uh, very excited to be here. Thank you, everyone. This is a cool uh, interactive forum here. I like, you know, it's, um, so feel free to ask questions through the chat. And again, thank you guys all for coming. Really appreciate it. So um, I am the Nutrition Science Director for Answers Pet Food. So uh, my name is Billy. I do a lot within the company. So I've been with the company about 10 years and I do research and development. I run our veterinary program. I run all of the education. Um, my favorite part of the job probably is developing the products, you know, and it's seeing all of the health outcomes, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, you know, based on uh, uh, using our products. So uh, really, really enjoy that part of the job as well. Um, and we are still, even though we're sold in 49 states and, and now I guess currently parts of Western Canada, um, we are still a small family owned company. So we are, um, you know, probably th less than 30 employees total. So we are doing the best we can. Um, so yes, thank you so much for, um, sorry, I'm going to try to stick to this. I'm used to doing lives. And so I read the comments, but, uh, um, I'll go ahead and, uh, just start that and, and, but it, remind, uh, reminder, if you do have a question, just let me know. So today, um, Answers Pet Food actually makes uh, fermented raw food. So we're going to talk about why, you know, fermentation helps food. So I think we all understand, um, you know, raw, the concept of raw food. I mean, the, the cool thing is there's actually, you know, studies, especially coming out of Europe right now that are actually talking, sort of proving scientifically what we already know. And that is that fresh food is healthier for mammals or raw food or less processed food. We all sort of know that, I think, innately, but, you know, now we're actually coming to know the science of that more, you know, which is always very, very exciting uh, for me. Um, that's really my passion is how do we apply whole foods to get better health outcomes. And I think fermentation is the way to do that because of the safety aspect and just the general, um, uh, the general, you know, health aspect and health benefits of fermentation. And also through this presentation, in terms of how we ferment our foods, I think you'll get an idea of why our foods are so healthy just from a sourcing standpoint, because that's a huge part of uh, why we do what we do. So this first slide here, um, I do like to try to include as many non um, stock photos as possible. So the, the two on the upper left, it's actually me giving a, um, also wearing a black t-shirt like currently giving a tour to one of our veterinarians uh, that's in our vet program. We actually have a, a vet program with about 60 vets um, who've officially signed on, who, who sell or recommend our products. Um, and that's one of our uh, vets, Dr. Rowan in Virginia Beach. And that's our biggest goat herd. We work with about 24, uh, it's either 24 or 26 uh, goat farmers. Um, and that's Irvin, that's our largest um, uh, herd there. There's also a really dorky picture of me in a hairnet, so that's exciting as well. I thought I would include that. Uh, the the squash there is actually our squash that goes into our detailed formula, which we'll talk about, um, and that's uh, pre-fermentation uh, there. So we'll talk about, because that's a huge part of obviously the fermented ingredients in terms of 
why the fermentation works. So on the bottom left there, those are our actual ducks um, that lay all of our duck eggs. It's one farm, is it? farmer, his name is Alan King. Um, and then you see this, those beautiful duck eggs next to it and you see those, that substance on there, which is dirt, uh, which actually goes into the food. And so we want your animal to be eating that polyculture soil to boost their immune, immune system, to give them, you know, to make them less susceptible to allergies. Uh, the, the evidence on that is pretty clear. So we're very, very proud to put dirt in our food, which again, we'll talk about uh, when it comes to the sort of bare bones of, of fermentation. Because the whole point of this is why fermentation works specifically. So that's where this is all going to be geared towards. Uh, and then on the bottom there, uh, this is actually Cole Harrington, who made a movie called Pet Fooled, which you all should watch. Um, and also um, my boss, Roxanne, who's one of the owners of the company. And then Steve, who actually not only makes all of our fermented bone broths, but he also um, uh, starts our kefir. Um, he's our connection to a lot of our, you know, the farmers we get chickens from. He's just an all-around amazing guy. So it's good, always good to get Steve in the, in the thing here. Let me just make sure I'm doing this right over here. Okay, cool. So then the newer comments are on top. That makes sense. Awesome. So this is my dog. And she is, you feel free to talk about how cute she is in the uh, chat section. If you've seen anything I do live, sort of presentations in, in, in real life or anything, I include many pictures, uh, at least one picture of Lua because she is the cutest dog in the world and the inspiration for my whole career. So she's 14 and she's doing great. So just FYI, that's my dog. There may be another, there may be a few uh, other ones in this presentation as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave that as a, as a, a preview. So what we're going to talk about in this uh, presentation. Um, so we're going to talk about what fermentation is. We're going to talk about how we go about fermenting our raw foods, why, how we know it works, and how fermentation actually makes food healthier. And then we'll actually have time to take questions. And I want to have a good amount of time to take questions. So if, again, feel free to ask during or afterward. That's totally fine. So um, that's going to be sort of how this works. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, fermentation. 101. So people have been doing fermentation since before, uh, since people have been people. So it was largely used to, as a food uh, pres preserving method before there was refrigeration. So this is a way, and cheese is a great example. I mean, you have all of this fresh milk and you know that fresh milk will go bad. So how do you preserve it? Cheese is a great way to do that. And that is a traditional type of fermentation. Uh, a lot of people's favorite fermentation is like beer and wine and those sorts of things. This is, that's sort of a different type of fermentation. Uh, sauerkraut, fermented vegetables, these were all ways to actually store uh, this stuff. And it's really cool because it's not a kill step. So uh, there's a huge difference between what we do and a kill step. So we're not doing something like high pressure pasteurization where you're looking to kill all of those uh, bad bacteria specifically, but then you're also killing good bacteria and you're, you know, denaturing the food in the same way, um, almost essentially as cooking. Um, we're also not looking to use something like bacteriophages, which is viruses that are introduced to kill certain pathogenic bacteria. So we're looking to do an inhibition step, which means so fermentation in a, in a nutshell here, and, and you'll notice the graphic here, there's a bunch of good bacteria and a few bad bacteria. That's what is in your stomach right now. You have salmonella in your stomach, you have all of these bad, you have a certain amount of bad bacteria in your stomach. So back, bad and good bacteria are ubiquitous. They're everywhere in our environment. So what we're trying to do is inhibit that bad bacteria from growing, because that's all that matters. If there's some cells of you know, pathogenic salmonella in your food and they can't grow, then it doesn't matter. So what we do is within every food, there's a certain amount of room for bacteria. So what we're doing is we're inoculating that food or filling it up with good bacteria. We're then allowing that bacteria to grow and fill up the food. So there's no room for bad bacteria. 
So this is different because this is how nature works as well. So we're able to keep our food in a raw food state while doing this fermentation. This is really the only way um, to do that um, and provide that extra food safety step, which we'll talk about uh, without actually, uh, you know, while keeping the food in a raw food state. So a lot of people actually think that fermentation is adding probiotics, but that is not true. It's the growth of bacteria. It's the growth of those uh, probiotics in regards to that. And it works every time when you do it right. So the really cool thing is I'm gonna show you some measurable results in terms of our fermentation and how we do that. Um, and so I think people sometimes get scared because they're like bacteria and I'm, adding bacteria and what's the deal, um, but it works every time. So also keep in mind, this is not, uh, this is a perishable food item. So it's not like uh, if you cure, which is another type of fermentation, like a summer sausage and it's at room temperature, that's not what we're talking about here. We have, it's not an overly our food. Some of our uh, products like the kefir or something will be lower um, in a more, more acidic food with lower pH. Um, but this is not a this is a pretty ph neutral food this is a pretty um uh this will go bad eventually because we want to keep it in the raw food state um if you get into the really low ph like with some of the summer sausage kind of stuff then it's almost like cooking it so that's not uh kind of what we're doing so keep in mind during this that it's the growth of that bacteria not the actual uh it's not just adding it because that's important there she is again just ridiculous. Um, she's actually sitting right by me in almost the same position. So just the cutest dog. So one of the things we have to talk about uh, when you talk about fermentation is sourcing because all of this matters even when the, the item itself is not particularly fermented. So uh, one of the things is when you're talking about food and you're talking about the present bacteria, you have to start with good bacteria. So you have to start with more good bacteria than bad bacteria. So you have to source impeccably to start off that process. So our meat that goes into our detailed formula, which is this uh, on the slide right here, is not particularly uh, fermented, but we have to introduce as much good bacteria as possible. This is why I brought the chicken onto here because a lot of people, you know, chicken kind of gets a bad rap in the pet food industry. Our chickens are amazing. And I wanted to, to give you an idea and, and you can carry this through to beef, pork, turkey, and, and duck, which we also do. But uh, I wanted to highlight the chicken specifically because I think it makes my point. So in our chicken formula, we have 25% uh, whole chickens. And those chickens are raised by us, for us, um, by local Pennsylvania farmers. And I know that people might be thinking this picture is gross of this chicken, but I put this on here specifically because the 25% of chickens look exactly like that. We actually put in the feet uh, and the head and the eyes and the beak, which doesn't sound very appetizing to you, but it is uh, would be very good for you, but is also uh, very, very nutrient dense, the brain, all those things. So with our 25%, we take all of these chickens that have a low uh, pathogen load because those are pastured chickens. They're out in the sun. They're not clumped together. They're in a natural environment. They're, they're foraging for bugs. They're eating grass and bugs. They're eating their natural diet. It's gonna have a low pathogen load to begin with. So with our 25% of our chickens, we actually only wash them in raw cultured whey. So these are really the only non-chemically produced chickens uh, in America because any USDA chicken is going to go through a lot of chemical washes that we're, we try to avoid as much as possible. Um, and they really only go into answers pet food. So that's the first thing we do to make sure that we're starting with a, with a low pathogen load and a high, um, and a high, uh, good bacteria load, a better bacteria load, um, is to do that. And also I'll, I'll the other 75% of the organ, uh, breast and thigh trim and bones are from pasture birds that are 100% certified organic um, that are GAP 2, 3, and 4 rated. 
So again, you're starting with that low pathogen load. Now those do obviously do go through a USDA facility. Side note. So the second thing on here again is we are talking about eggs. So um, again, a lot of people, a lot of brands maybe go away from eggs when it comes to the raw food industry because they're worried about, you know, potentially salmonella, those types of things. But eggs that are raised correctly, there's virtually no risk for salmonella. So these eggs are actually, um, the chickens are, or the ducks are really cool because they don't even like the shelter that much. So they're out in the fields all day. Actually, last time I was there, it was really cool. There was a horse, uh, there was a particular part of the pasture that the horses go through and then the horses left and I was watching the ducks go through and just pick the bugs and and everything that the horses leave behind and attract all those bugs and all that kind of stuff. And they go through there and, and that also sort of makes the pasture work. It sort of, you know, re-fertilizes uh, the soil, having those multiple species go through there. These are the best eggs in the world. We also sell these um, as by themselves, which I would also recommend, but these are definitely the best eggs in the world. But again, not only are they gonna be much more nutrient dense, but from a bacteria standpoint, we are going to not really have to worry about salmonella, et cetera. And also this is the first part of the, the thing where we're inoculating our food with different types of bacteria. So these are gonna be soil microbes. You saw the picture of the other one with some of the, that dirt on there. These are gonna be soil microbes that go in there. And if you go to any good part of pasture and take a huge clump of it, there's gonna be trillions of different types of organisms in that the polyculture farm pasture. So again, we're, this is, we're introducing those soil microbes. That's kind of the first part of the, the fermentation process in regards to that. So uh, this is a huge part of how our food gets fermented as well. So all of these organic carrots are grown by local Pennsylvania farmers. They're delivered to a guy named John, who's an amazing person. He works at our um, plant four days a week, and then he also does a lot of other stuff for us. So uh, he actually contracts some local organic farmers and they deliver these vegetables. He then cuts, chops them up and ferments them for seven days before they're going into the um, food. So what that does is, and it's a really cool ferment. So we're just putting salt in it. So that's what's called a wild ferment. So we're just letting all these natural bacteria grow that are innately in there. We're not starting it with a culture or anything like that. And the ferment is so good that it's at room temperature, but the water bubbles. Um, so we get this really great uh, ferment. So we're getting all this positive bacteria. The other really cool nutritional component to this is the fact that you get everything you want from vegetables, including the fiber, including the phytonutrients, everything like that. But then you also don't get uh, any of the sugar because those act. So again, we're inoculating that uh, we're sort of putting an environment with that salt where those ba natural bacteria are going to grow and they're going to eat the sugar. So it's sort of like uh, pickles that are fermented naturally are very good for you because they're full of probiotics um, and they get that tangy taste is because the bacteria are eating all of the sugar. So this is a big part of how we inoculate our food. So keep in mind that these are already living cultures that are living in uh, a food environment and then go into the food. If we were to just add probiotics to our food, there's no way they would grow. It takes this type of environment for that to work. So the next thing, and again, the, the things I'm highlighting on this are the, the fermented ingredients. So the next thing, and, and you notice it doesn't say fermented cod liver, it's because AFCO will not let us put the word ferment, fermented on our ingredient panel. You'll notice it on other parts of the packaging, but for some reason that's not an AFCO approved word, which is totally ridiculous. So these fermented cod livers, and they're the actual livers themselves, are fermented for several months. And so obviously you're getting all of the wonderful nutritional parts of livers, but you're also getting, and this is a natural brine as well. So keep in mind now you have the soil microbes so far, the, the, uh, and the vegetables that are fermented on a farm in a wild ferment, this natural brine, you're gonna get hundreds and hundreds of different species of bacteria here. So remember when you look at your uh, supplement, your probiotic supplement, you're talking about several different um, species. This is gonna be already hundreds of different species. So this is another food we inoculate that with. So this is a big part of our 
operation just generally, you'll notice a lot of our foods are actually fermented with whey. So this is actually raw cultured whey. So it's not whey powder, this is whey. When you make cheese, that's why I put the cheese picture on there, you get the curds and then the whey is the liquid that separates off of that. So whey is one of the best forms of, in its raw state, um, it's one of the healthiest, most underrated foods on the planet. And it's one of the best forms of protein as well. Uh, it's, re it's, it's unique in its ability uh, from raw milk to boost the immune system through glutathione. But so for the fermentation purposes, what happens is the whey itself is separated. You get this liquid whey and it's full of billions of probiotics. So we add a certain amount of whey to inoculate the food with all of those uh, probiotics and then you get the other health benefits as well. So the, the other thing we, we're gonna talk about on here is our kefir. So the kefir itself um, is our fermented raw cow milk kefir. So this again is, is just, I think, a cool story. So we actually start every uh, batch with kefir grains from California, um, uh, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And actually, we, we brought some kefir grains back from Poland as my boss was doing last summer, a, or two summers ago. Uh, was doing a, a research trip to Switzerland. That sounds pretty great. Um, I did not get to do that one. Um, and we start all of those separately to get those different yeast and, and bacteria cultures, and then we put them all in every single batch that we make. So you get all those wonderful healthy yeasts and all those hundreds of different probiotic cultures within the uh, kefir itself. So we put the kefir in the food to inoculate it with that good yeast specifically, but also all of those probiotics as well, as well as the nutrition from raw milk just generally. And obviously you can make your own, or I mean, obviously like um, when it, I, that was like a total nonsensical statement. So that's what happens when I try to drink water um, and talk at the same time. So obviously we sell kefir as well. So you can, and this is, like I said, this is just the best kefir in the world in terms of it being totally raw. We ferment this at 80 to 90 degrees and just, um, we actually got a new kefir farmer recently and he makes, I mean, his, his products are absolutely incredible. He, he has a farm store as well, but I think our kefir really stepped up. And also one of the other changes we, we made was, uh, we actually load the kefir now and move it through gravity. So we don't even have to work through um, like pumping it because we, we don't want to sort of damage it even in that way. So that was a really cool improvement as well. I have to be able to do that. So you can see here that it's the sum of all of its parts. It's not just the we're adding probiotics. It's that we're adding, you know, five or six different foods that are all living, have living probiotics inside of them and living bacteria inside of them. Uh, and they are, um, all in a food environment and they're all actually inoculating this food with bacteria. So as the food sits in your fridge for seven days, which is the shelf life of the product, it will actually become safer and healthier, which we'll talk about in a second. So it's a sum of all of its parts in order to do that. So we did, and, and we know this works because all of my bacteria are healthy there just for the, or are happy there just for the record. So uh, we did a 16 week, 77, uh, uh, sample safety validation. So we did chicken, beef, turkey, and pork. Uh, we did not have duck at this time when we were doing it, although we do random testing as well, but for the purposes of this, this is the one we did. So we tested for E. coli, salmonella, listeria, which you're trying to avoid and lactic acid bacteria, which are those wonderful probiotics that help protect the food. We tested at differing temperatures and differing lengths of time. So we tested for all those things at right when it was thawed at 24 to 48 hours uh, in the refrigerator, at seven days in the refrigerator, because that's the shelf life of the food. And then if we also want to test if somebody mishandled it. So if it was tested at, so we tested it at 24 hours at room temperature and 48 hours at room temperature. And the results were amazing, yet predictable. It's exactly what we would expect given the fact that we know how to ferment foods and that again, this is a traditional method that we can verify through science. 
So what happened was this, during this time, we didn't have any, during any, right when it was thawed, we had no measurable E. coli, salmonella, or listeria. And we had no growth or appearance of any of those pathogens through the entire length of any of those times, including the 48 hours at room temperature. So we, we are essentially the only food, food company that has a built-in safety mechanism that actually lets the food become safer as it sits in your refrigerator, or even in this case, at room temperature. So, and the really cool thing was we could actually track the growth of those lactic acid bacteria or the probiotics, and those probiotics grew exponentially through that process as well. Wherein at the end of about, you know, seven days, you're talking about seven, uh, I'm sorry, two billion probiotics per ounce, um, just in the food alone, wherein at 48 hours of room temperature, it was up to 12 billion probiotics just in the food alone, which means it's actually the safest when somebody mishandles it. So that is, I think, a really cool sort of difference in Answers Pet Food and why fermentation is uh, one, safer. Um, and also with all of our fecal samples through our uh, feeding trials, through other fecal samples, we've never had a, a positive salmonella sample, which is kind of crazy because the CDC even said that about 30% of dogs uh, shed salmonella regardless of what they eat. Doesn't matter if it's kibble, canned, whatever. It's a natural part, but I think we're, we're you know, making strides in creating these incredible, uh, incredibly sort of favorable environments uh, when it comes to uh, good bacteria. So the really cool thing was, you know, we can actually go to the veterinary community with this data. Um, and I, I, when you could actually go places uh, <laughs> and have gatherings, uh, I, you know, speaking at vet schools, we're able to take this data in and say, hey, look, uh, we know some of you are not going to like raw food and you're going to think it's dangerous, but your clients are going to do it anyway. So why not recommend the one that we can prove is safe through fermentation? So and we've been actually making some headway with that. So the food itself is uh, safe. So that's the moral of uh that story as well. Here's another one too, um, just to show you, just to, this is another good example um, of that growth that we can track. So this is our fermented raw goat milk and you can see the data there. Uh, so you can see that's over five days of growth in the refrigerator. So obviously when you, uh, when bacteria is at room temperature, it's gonna grow faster because it's gonna be more favorable for growth. Uh, rather than in the refrigerator, but you can see the probiotic increase uh, even when the milk is in the refrigerator for 30 days. So our milk is, to my knowledge, is the only truly fermented raw milk on the market, um, at least in America. I do know that is the case. And so it's good for 30 days in your fridge and it will be healthier on the 30th day and safer than it was on the first day. And this is the graph that will show you that. The second graph there is to show you what happens at 24 hours at room temperature. So you get to about the same amount, um, sorry, it's like really small on my screen, but you get to about the same amount of probiotics, but that's only at 16 hours because you're um, up to 24 hours um, at room temperature because they work so much faster. So one of the cool things that I do whenever I unthaw a, a pint of our milk uh, for my dog is I actually put it on the counter until it becomes um, uh, until it becomes totally thawed, and then I leave it um, out for another twenty four hours, which I think is you know just makes it healthier. And then I put it in my fridge and store it there. And sorry about the um, there's a there's a picture on the slide that says the raw feeding veterinary society. So sorry about that. I just recently spoke at a conference in England and some of the slides are uh, intermixed. So apologize for that. Uh, I shouldn't say I spoke in England. I spoke here. I would have liked to have gone to England, but obviously that's not in the cards for currently. Um, so this will show you again, how we can track that growth for that good bacteria. Here she is again, just ridiculous. She's in a hoodie. She hates clothes, but sometimes I make her wear them because the pictures are adorable. Uh, so sorry about that. But again, these are the best slides anyway. We, we could just do a whole slideshow of Lua. So 
just uh, throwing that out there. So uh, that wall was, uh, I lived in, in uh, downtown LA at the time. So how does the, how, how does fermentation make the food healthier? So this is pretty cool. So the basics, just so you know, um, we do have feeding trial data. So we have an adult maintenance feeding trial that we did with um, uh, Hemopet and in California with, with uh, Dr. Gene Dodds. Um, that was on our beef formula. And then we formulate all of our other ones to meet those same nutrient profiles, which also meet the nutrient profiles of growth and lactation. Now for our cat food, we actually have an entire year long feeding trial on our chicken. Um, that is for adult maintenance growth and lactation. And then we also, um, we also, what you call it? Oh, we also uh, formulate all of our other ones to meet those same nutrient profiles. Um, you know, if you look at duck, turkey, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and then we, and then we make sure that they also meet those nutrient profiles. So we do have all of that, um, data there, just FYI. Um, and that's just kind of part of, uh, sort of like an aside there, but fermentation pre-metabolizes the food. So that little happy guy there, what he's going to do is he's going to, when those bacteria grow, they're actually eating the food, right? So they're eating all of that and they're sort of pre-metabolizing the food. So fermented foods require less calories to maintain overall health. So if you take another brand of raw food, one that is the same amount of calories as ours, you will feed less of ours by usually about 25%, which, which is the data I got when I looked at our competitors' feeding recommendations, et cetera. And that's because the food is pre-metabolized by that bacteria. So the cool thing is that'll save you money because you'll actually be doing so the price of the food is not the price per pound it's how much you feed so you'll actually end up paying a lot less for our food than other brands because you'll be feeding less um, because the calories are easy, easy, easier to metabolize take less work from the body so those bacteria also produce extra enzymes so you have the innate enzymes within the raw foods themselves but they also those bacteria go ahead and produce extra enzymes so it's easier to digest um, in regards to that. So the bacteria also produce more vitamins. So you get especially B vitamins, but you get a lot, and you also get vitamin C. Um, there's a lot of vitamins that are produced through, and it's cool because those bacteria, is just a byproduct of them eating the food, is they're producing those extra vitamins. So you're going to have more enzymes in this food than, than let's say, just raw food, you are going to have um, more vitamins as well. And also you get also, um, you know, great organic acids as well. So one of the great uh, organic acids that's produced through certain types of fermentation is called acetic acid. And that's that. So when, like, that's like that vinegar type taste, like if you're drinking kombucha or something like that. And acetic acid um, has a, a host of health benefits, including uh, helping your blood sugar not rise too quickly, um, just as one example. Uh, but you're getting these extra organic acids as well. And also, you can go back into the probiotic thing. So probiotics, we're, we're learning more and more about the gut and how that works and about how uh, the gut is basically where health starts and about how it can even affect behavior. And, and you know, they're now, they're now saying that, you know, you can affect things like ADD and depression, you know, based on your microbiome. And so this is a hugely important new uh, sort of uh, study and research that people are doing. And so the cool thing is we're reverting to nature here. So again, we're not, you're not taking a pill that has certain probiotics in it. You're getting hundreds and hundreds of different species. And those species will vary based on the batch that you're doing. Because not every batch is going to ferment exactly the same. Not every batch is going to, you know, have exactly the same dirt. Um, all those things. So there's variants there and you get all those probiotics, you know, again, even raw milk itself has 200 species of probiotics before we ferment it. So you're getting all of those uh, amazing probiotics into your dog and cat um, when just by feeding the food. So you can also save money by not doing probiotic supplements. Um, soil microbe supplements are becoming, you know, all the rage. If you want good soil microbes, eat dirt. And your dog or cat will be doing that uh, in this. Um, so this is going to be an amazing source of uh, those probiotics. 
So uh, there we go. So it was about 35 minutes, um, kind of cruised through that. So uh, before we take some questions, and I do see one question, um, I see a few questions actually, so that's great. So um, before we take questions, if you have any questions beyond this or you want, you know, info, we have a really great product guide that talks about everything we do. We have an awesome health guide that talks about all of our diets that are specifically written for disease conditions. So kidney disease, diabetes, we have a whole host. Each one of those has a worksheet so you can figure it out for your dog. If you want any of that information, just email us at info at answerspetfood.com. And also, um, if you're looking for more information like this, um, you can uh, check out our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and type in Answers Pet Food, and that should come up for you. So I'm just going to go down the line here with the questions. So the first question is, how do you switch your pet to a raw diet? So it's pretty simple. The thing about switching the first time is you have to transition. And that's something we do to our dogs and cats. It's not like dogs and cats in the wild transition to different foods. So once you actually transition them onto a raw diet, you can pretty much feed them something different every day if you wanted to, and their digestive systems are more or less like ours. Um, so something to think about there. I would, if your dog, has never had raw food in, in its uh, entire life, um, I would do like a week or two transition. So if you're doing a week, you could do like 25% answers and 75% for two, for two days, 75% the other food. Then you could go to 50% answers and 50% other food for two days. Then you could do 75% answers and 25% uh, other food for two days. Um, and then on the seventh day, you could be 100% transitioned. So I'm fighting off a sneeze, so I apologize for that. Uh, so that would be a good way to do it. But once you do, you can kind of just switch between our products. Or you could do that for two weeks. It just depends. The other thing you want to think about when you're transitioning your, your uh, dog or cat is the fact that just because you see diarrhea doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. People always want to change something whenever uh, they see diarrhea, but that that can just be the body's reaction. And most of the time, if you're making that switch and you just keep going, it, it will work itself out. So a lot of people also think their dog's intolerant to something if they eat it and have diarrhea, which is not true. I mean, think about yourself. If you go to a restaurant and eat chicken and have some digestive issues, do you go, well, I can't ever eat chicken again? No, probably not. So um, someone asked about a recording, which will be posted to Cherry Book's website in a few days. FYI. Um, Claudia says, is there any particular protein better for senior dogs? Um, no, all of ours are one to one fat to protein ratio. Um, and they're all, so we, we formulate them to be as similar as possible for those who don't rotate. So really any of them work for seniors. Um, Sherry asked, do you offer breeder programs? Um, I don't, this is actually not part of um, I don't do the store retail programs, but um, I don't think that we do. Um, but if you would like to see that, then I would email, you know, info at Answers Pet Food and just, you know, make that as a suggestion. And uh, that will get to the people who are uh, in charge of that. Karen says, hi, Billy. My dog is highly allergic to white fish and cod. Is this something I should be concerned about with the fermented cod livers? Uh, no, not typically. So it could be because I can't guarantee this, but what happens is there are a lot of dogs and cats that cannot eat regular beef, but can eat our beef. And the reason why is because those cultures, it's a low sugar environment. So they become proteolytic, which means they eat protein and fat and change it into usable carbohydrates, which changes the structure of that protein. So I don't think because these are fermented, in a brine for several months, I don't think you'll have issues with it. It's not to say it's impossible, but I don't think you do. And if you do, you could move to our straight formula plus the goat milk and key or kefir. Claudia says, would senior dogs benefit from fermented answer? Yes. If you put your senior dog who is maybe on a processed diet right now or a regular raw diet, 
and put them on our products exclusively, you will see major health uh, changes um, because most senior dogs are suffering from like small things, you know, they're stiff or they don't move quite as well, or, you know, their nose is really dry or, you know, there's all these things you typically see, which we don't see with animals, you know, on our products. Um, So Donna says, does fermenting with salt put too much salt into the food for dogs? No, it just depends. So the salt we use, so we use very small amounts of salt. So if you look at like, let's say our fish stock, we ferment our sardines with whey, that raw cultured whey and sea salt, but it's a small part of the formulation. And also sea salt, which is, so a lot of people think salt is sodium. That's just not true. Table salt is essentially sodium. So we use Redmond Real Salt, which is a whole sea salt that actually has um, a very awesome mineral and trace element profile. So we actually put sea salt in our food because we help to remineralize what you lose from the soils being sort of uh, depleted. So um, no, there won't be too much salt. And, and the, the main reason why is because we're using that, uh, that uh, fermented, or I'm sorry, the, 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 um, I, they just lost my train of thought. Oh, the Redmond real salt. So Ronald says, what is the difference between the detailed and the straight formula? The detailed is complete and balanced in and of itself. It has all of the ingredients that we talked about. The straight formula is meat, organ and bone. So it's 98% meat, organ and bone, 2% whey, and, and that a little bit of that sea salt. And you, that's a limited ingredient diet that you combine with our goat milk or kefir or our new duck eggs to be complete and balanced. Kathy says, which is more beneficial for dogs, goat's milk or kefir? They're both equally beneficial. They just have different benefits. So um, most milks are the same, typically very close to being the same. So when it comes to... Um, uh, nutrient profile. So it doesn't matter if it's human breast milk or camel milk or dog milk or cow milk or whatever it might be. They're all relatively similar. Um, but you do get different benefits from different species, different fat profiles, that kind of thing. For healthy dogs, I'd highly recommend rotating between the two because you get a different type of fermentation. If one works better, that's great. You know, that's going to be really healthy as well. Um, but it just kind of depends on what you want to do there. And uh, you do get obviously the different ferment because um, the goat's milk is fermented with two buttermilk cultures, wherein the kefir is fermented with kefir grain. So it's, it's different health benefits. Cow milk gets a bad rap, but all raw milk is amazing. So Wendy says, what is the difference between your goat's milk and your competitors? The difference is ours is the only one that's actually fermented. So um, there's a difference between adding back probiotics and fermenting it. So, um, that is the difference. Uh, Barbara says, have you tested your product with diabetic dogs? Yes, we have, we have tested. Um, so the way that we work with, so we, we have a specific diabetes protocol and the way that we work with that is by working with animals with that disease condition and then monitoring them in their specific symptoms. So it could be diabetes, it could be kidney disease, could be all those things. Um, so we're doing that. Um, Kathy says, do you have any data on benefit of a raw diet and canine epilepsy? Yes. Two things I would, I like for canine epilepsy. Um, number one, uh, the best results we've had is with our two to one ketogenic diet. So if you actually, again, email info at answers, and you can, um, uh, get our health guide. We have a two to one. We actually have a four to one, three to one, two to one and one to one uh, ketogenic diet. And that two to one um, ketogenic diet is two parts fat to one part protein. And we've seen, uh, especially it started, I guess, in human children, which is where the data was for preventing uh, seizures in epilepsy. Uh, but then people started trying it with dogs and we, we've worked with a lot of uh, epileptic dogs and seeing good results. Also a good CBD oil usually helps that as well. But I mean, we don't do that, but I've just, you know, seen the benefit of that as well. But uh, I'd highly recommend if your dog suffers from canine epilepsy, going on our two to one ketogenic protocol. So another question, 
Does the does a raw diet help with coat quality? It absolutely does. So the coat is a good indication of uh, really, you know, some health factors and, and how healthy your dog is, just like, you know, in you and, and how your skin looks. And you need all of those proper fatty acids that are not, you know, denatured through heat. You need all of that, um, uh, you know, all of those nutrients and they're just provided. So for those of you that are watching this and your dog's on a processed food, if you switch your dog to our food, you'll probably notice their coat get much better in like two weeks. And if you really want it to get much better, I would recommend our fermented fish stock with that as well. Uh, so question is, many schnauzers are known for developing both types of stones. Would a fermented diet slash food prevent stone development? Yeah, I think that sto stone development has has a ton, has a lot to do with the processing of food because we have animals that deal with both types of stone that just switch to even our detail formula and then don't deal with it again. So, you know, just, just something to think about. Start with food first. So what I do is start with food get on an, an unprocessed raw diet. And then if you need to do medical intervention beyond that, start there. But how are you gonna know if your animal can be healthy if they're not on healthy food to begin with? So Rachel says, my dog has uh, environmental allergies that impact his skin, Has have tried kefir a few times at different times of the year and it seems to exacerbate his skin issues. We use the detailed nibbles in goat milk and he's still itchy, is it possible that goat milk should be stopped he loves it and we've used your products for over a year this summer he lost a ton of hair and had yeast issues pretty bad yeah it sounds like a heavy shot of detox there so sometimes they can kind of roller coaster and get you know better and um and get kind of you know better and worse and better and worse but you might want to try the straight formula um we actually have an allergy protocol if you reach out to us and get our health guide. So you may want to try that. Um, you could try the straight formula with the goat milk. Um, I don't think your dog's allergic to milk. Um, so try, if, if it gets particularly bad, you, you could maybe try milk diet, uh, which is something that we employ as well um, in regards to that. So, um, but the other thing you can do specifically with a, with a detailed question like this is to email us because one of our people can help work through your specific case as well, Rachel. So just throwing that out there. Peggy says, do you help me to match food to calories that are recommended for my dog? Scotty's often have high liver enzymes. Uh, will raw help with that? We actually have a liver protocol and part, part, yeah, par partially that was developed uh, by looking at cases with high liver enzymes and then applying raw milk and seeing those liver enzymes come down. Because raw milk has every known uh, digestive enzyme, so it's easy on the pancreas, the liver, the kidney. Um, it requires almost no work from the body to digest. So I would recommend at least doing our detailed formula with double the recommended amount of goat milk. Um, and I would expect those to come down. So. Um, we also, if you want to know how much to feed, we have a feeding calculator on our website. So you put in your dog's weight and age level or uh, activity level, and you'll get all of that information you need. Should be good. Peggy says, uh, no, that was you. Sorry. Barbara says, wouldn't it depend on the type of stone? Well, it, it would and it wouldn't. Because what I find is that when it comes to using actual whole food with its innate moisture and with those delivery systems. So let me give you an analogy here. There are dogs that have trouble assimilating calcium. Partially that's because they're eating food that doesn't have, for instance, vitamin K2, which is highly a big part of, you know, why we put butter in our food, why we uh, advocate for raw dairy, because it actually tells the body what to do with calcium. So we've actually seen both, um, both, uh, types of stones not be an issue, just switching onto our food, but highly recommend, you know, if you're dealing with that, using our fermented raw dairy as well. So, all right, so I think with that, I think we can um, call it a go. So thank you guys for coming, really appreciate that. Um, and thank you so much to Cherry Brook for setting this all up. They are a fine local retailer that, um, 
you know, the great thing about local pet stores like that is they're vetting the products for you. They are educated on the products. You can go in there. I'm sure any of you who have questions can also go into Cherry Brook. And remember, you know, shopping at your local retailers is very, very important during this time because, you know, it's all about putting that money back in your community. It's about putting people to work in your community. And so pet stores are really important in my opinion. So fight the urge to, to you know, go to the big guys and check out uh, Cherry Brook. So thank you so much, Cherry Brook. And uh, everybody have a good night.